Let us pray. We offer to you our words, O oh God, those tiny chips of meaning we spread abroad so easily and often so thoughtlessly. Keep us ever attentive to the impact of our words, particularly the way they can cause pain or foster insecurity. Make of our speech a force that does not destroy, but rather builds up. So even our voices of protest may serve the greater cause of reconcil reconciling the human race to you. Amen. You may be seated and the children may come forward for the children's message. Good morning. How is everyone? Isn't it so pretty outside today? Cold. Well, it's warmer than it has been some days. So I have things here, and I bet you guys know what these are. And I bet you know the right names for them. I don't even call them the right names. What are these called? AirPods. Maybe I can get it open. These are Ella's. Don't tell her, she's sleeping off a of dance, so. What are these called? I know what these are called. I called these the wrong name. Earbuds, right? Oh, see, not really. <laughs> okay, so what do you do with these? You put them in your ears and you listen to music. Can you listen to more than just music? What do you listen to? Look at you, you're right. Arlo, can you sit down? River Song? Amaya, can you guys look at me for a minute? Let's look at these. What, do you, what can you listen to in these? River Song, what can you listen to? Music? And I like music. You like music? I know you do. And I listen to podcasts in them. Do you guys know what those are? They're like stories. We've, we've made full circle back to talk radio. Um, it's just online now. So, so some people listen to podcasts. Some people listen to books. Have you ever listened to an audio book? It's just somebody reading it. And some people listen to music. Some people listen to the news. And some people watch movies with them. So when... Your piano is broke? I'm so sorry. Is it a little electric piano or a big piano? Like a keyboard? Yeah. Do you like playing it? I know how to do how my music I know. Okay, so when you have these in, can you hear? Can you hear what's going on when you have these in? Have you ever worn them? No? Okay. In our house, you'll see a lot of people walking around just wearing one in their ear. Ella and Pastor Chris do that to me a lot. And then I don't know they're listening to something and they take it out and go, what? After I've been talking to them. Don't they, River Song? Yeah. Yes, Ella does that a lot. And so when you have these in, you can't hear very well. They even have noise canceling ones where you, you Pastor Chris has noise canceling ones where you can't hear what's going on around you if you have both of them in. When I run with the babies, I just wear one so that I can hear them if they need me. So you can only have one, but you know what's really cool is when you have them in and you have both of them in, you're kind of in a whole world of just listening. It really uses your focus on listening. It kind of just takes you right there. Like I'm doing the dishes and I forget that I'm doing the dishes because you're just in this little world by yourself because it makes it just so nice. Or if um, Paw Patrol is playing in the car, Mama pops these in, and then I don't have to listen to Paw Patrol, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, anyways. Yeah, my kid, I Paw Patrol, so I 
Oh, your grandma's going to find a Paw Patrol toy for you? I love Paw Patrol toys. So what I want us to think about is what if we listen to other people that well? Where if we're in, we have these, like we had these in, where they were the only thing we could hear. Do you think we would learn a lot more about what people might need? No. You don't? I think we would. Because you know what I think when we're listening usually? We're thinking about what we're going to say when they're talking. Our brains kind of are ahead of the game, and we don't mean to, but we start thinking, like, how am I going to respond to what they're saying? Instead of taking a pause and really listening. So sometimes we don't hear. Sometimes River Song can be really grumpy and whiny, believe it or not. And sometimes I have to listen to those whines and think, she's not meaning to be so whiny. She's really tired and needs some extra love right now. And so I think if we could go out as I've totally lost it, um, it's okay. Um, I think if we could go out as Christians and start really listening to people like that, like we have special ear po air pods, earbuds, whatever they're called, just for them. River Song, can you listen like that? Okay. Yes, you have a green iPad. I know. So what I want to challenge everyone here is if you can start listening to people like you listen in your earphones, really focused on them, we may hear more than what they are even saying because we're so focused on their them and their heart and their eyes and their body. So that's what I want to challenge you guys to. And, I'm, and I want to say one more thing before we go. You know who Mr. Mike is? Yes. Yep. Do you know who Mr. Mike is? Yes, you do. Yes. Amaya, do you know who Mr. Mike is? He comes up here and plays his ukulele. Yesterday he called me and he was really upset because his wife fell and broke her um, wrist and they were touring a college and now she has to see a surgeon. And so I'm asking everyone to pray for them. And Mr. Mike was very shook up. And so if we could pray for them and for him to be calm and pray for Penny, not his wife, not to have pain, I would really appreciate it, okay? Because he was, you know what he was thinking about? Who's going to fill in for him because he didn't want to let you guys down, okay? So we can pray for him, okay? Let's pray, and then we'll, we'll do whatever. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for these children, and thank you for their, their interest in each other and their love for each other, and... Um, Please let your light shine out of them as they go out into the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You'd never guess that half of that group uh, uh, wasn't asleep at the same time uh, at all last night and still has the energy like that. It's amazing. Uh, let us continue with our worship. Uh, as we do, I will remind you that we are approaching our prayer time, and if you do have joys and concerns to share, uh, you can fill out those cards on the back of your pews to do so. Now let me invite you to stand once more as we sing our hymn 128, He Leadeth Me, verses 1 through 3.
place my hand in thine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. Once again, on the back of your bulletins, uh, you will find the joys and concerns list. I will let you look through that at your leisure. If you are joining us online, please use the comment section to share with us your joys and concerns. Those handed to me, uh, one uh, from Pat Mosley, uh, wants prayers for Aaron Woolley. Woolley? Uh, is a friend who uh, suffered a stroke. So please lift uh, Aaron Woolley up uh, in your prayers. And it is good to see Mario uh, with us this morning. And Susan, very good to have you back with us this morning. Prayers answered. And uh, for the terrible devastation in Florida, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I've there was a news program on when I was in middle school called Channel One, and I can remember watching overhead views of the devastation from Hurricane Andrew and thinking, gosh, that, you know, that happens quite a lot. You know, what's it? You know, they're, we're, we're rebuilding these things in, in, in places. They get destroyed all the time. Same place in Kansas. I just, and, and we do that. It's their home. I don't, what do we do? And not only that, Miami floods on a sunny day. I mean, this is a problem, and if we don't see it, it's going to be an even bigger problem that none of us is going to be able to not pay attention to, no matter how much we don't want to. Uh, also, uh, Rosalie is asking for prayers for her daughter-in-law, uh, sister, daughter-in-law's sister, Lynn, who lives in Fort Myer. Gosh, uh, is everything, okay. It, uh, absolutely, it we have pictures from this past summer of the family and I hunkering under that pier in Fort Myers that was just wiped out. It was absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it, a devastating situation. And here's the thing. There are a handful of other completely devastating situations that I could list and go over all, each one right now. That's sort of, the, sort of the world we're living in right now, right? No matter where you look, people's lives are being devastated by Mother Nature, by the violence we inflict on each other. It's a good time to be in prayer. So let me invite you to quiet your minds and hearts and go with me before God in prayer. Lord, we pray for your presence with us in all the changing seasons of life. The joy of the birth of a child for which we give you praise. And the sadness of death, look with grace and mercy on those who are in distress. O oh Lord, for those who mourn, we pray that you would give them hope, patience, and courage. Give them, too, we pray, the ability to entrust themselves to others and to you. We ask that you would enable counselors, pastors, friends, and others 
who could help to use their training, skill, and love in the service of your comforting love. Let those who grieve be open to the healing presence of your great spirit and the caring love of friends, family, and church. Reveal the closeness of your love and your presence to those who ache from the pains of death. Empower them through your grace, strength, and wisdom. All family members and friends who care about those who mourn deeply, whatever the nature of that loss may be. May we truly know that even beyond the valley of death is the mountaintop adventure of eternal life. Lord, also help us to know that the journey of life eternal is a grand adventure far surpassing any earthly experience and far beyond our most hope-filled imaginations. All this we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, who came to us that we might have life and have it in abundance and joy, and in whose name we now pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture for the morning is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to promote the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I serve with a good conscience, as my ancestors did. I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. When I remember your tears, I long to see you that I can be filled with happiness. I'm reminded of your authentic faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I'm sure that this faith is also inside you because of this. I am reminding you to revive God's gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands. God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. So don't be shamed, ashamed of the testimony about the Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share the suffering for the good news, depending on God's power. God is the one who saved and called us with a holy calling. This wasn't based on what we have, but it is based on his own purpose and grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now his grace is revealed through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus. He destroyed death and brought life and immortality into clear focus through the good news. I was appointed a messenger, apostle, and teacher of this good news. This is also why I'm suffering the way I do, but I'm not ashamed. I know the one in whom I've placed my trust. I'm convinced that God is powerful enough to protect what he has placed in my trust until that day. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you heard from me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Protect this good thing that has been placed in your trust through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O 
Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And I guess naturally, people have been asking me uh, to maybe sort of dish on uh, my decision to leave the ministry, as it were, I give the sort of the what, the where, the why, and to church people, this one tends to be pretty important, uh, the who, unfortunately, in the church, as much as preachers say that gossip should be avoided, it doesn't really get avoided, uh, but uh, I don't really have any of that to share with you. I will say that whatever you think the answer is, it's not likely that, <laughs> very honestly. Uh, I think that I've been, not I think, I've been making this decision unconsciously for the past few years, and so there's not one, like, event that I can point to, what I can point to, and that, like, there's no silver bullet, but, you know, there are things that, that I think churches should work on. I can and will share a couple of those things. First, when you talk to servers, do you know who they tell you are the worst tippers? Christians. It's kind of sad and a little disgusting to me. I, we, t- we tip very well, but by and large, Christians don't tip very well. I've seen this in play, and it's, it's heartbreaking. That's a very public way, a simple and public way. People see the love of Christ in our lives, and yet we're okay with that. Maybe we should worry, work about on that one. Uh, your concern for church facilities over events or actual ministry into people's lives shows where our heart truly lies. Like, if we're more worried about a coaster out of place in the parlor or a hymnal that's lying somewhere on the floor by the front door, we're doing church wrong, folks. And it is going to kill us further. I had a church that I served uh, in LaPorte, Indiana. We had, it was a small country church, but just two miles down the road was a very large apartment complex that had a lot of young families that uh, would be, would do great. I thought we could do a postcard push and get them all to VBS. I thought that'd be great. That idea was shot down because that apartment complex is full of younger families. And those younger families tend to have uh, children that are black and brown colored. And people were worried about the condition of the facilities if we were to let those children come in and, and, and work in that church. That's a bit of what I'm talking about. And, and, it, and when we go through those things, I can tell you that is so much harder for a pastor to Uh, think about doing something else when you're shot down on something that should be so stupidly simple. We do it. All right, and then this is the last one. Parting words, if you will. But my real parting words won't be for a month. I don't care your political leanings. Uh, They need to be much less part of the identity of the 21st century American church. If any part of your blood boils when I mention a particular politician and, and, and the Holy Spirit doesn't come right in and knock that down in you, you're doing it completely wrong, right? Full stop. It's unbelievable to me that, that, we ha- that this is the case. I, I grew up being preached a Jesus that didn't give a crap about any of that stuff. And I spent a career preaching a Jesus that didn't care any about that stuff. And here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, the church needs to address some of these things. Like I said, these aren't my actual parting words. My parting words will come later, and they're going to encapsulate all the love that I feel for church people as I leave. But it should get us thinking And it does get us thinking about parting words because we hold this idea of parting words a little higher than we do other types of normal words, right? Right? If we said, uh, if it was said on your way out, uh, either figuratively or literally, we romanticize those to a degree, right? Some deserve it and others may not. Here are some. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. 
But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to go do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not go there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And unbeknownst to most people on earth at that moment, those were the parting words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because the next day he was shot on that balcony. Like MLK, the Apostle Paul sees the specter of death hovering about him. But perhaps for the Apostle Paul, for whom death is gain, it was neither the specter nor angel of death, but a beam or angel of light that he sensed as he dictated his letter to Timothy, his son in the faith. And to properly understand the aging Apostle's parting words, we should focus on them for a moment, and the context specifically, because when we look at it, he was not that old. But the sum of his age plus the political situation in Rome was discouraging. I mean, he wasn't stupid. He knew that he was wobbling on the doorstep of death and the portal would open soon. The time of my departure has come, he says. He sensed that time was slipping away. I'm ready to be poured out as a libation, he says. The year is 67 A.D. He's doing time in jail in Rome for the second time under Nero, an emperor whose days are also drawing to a close. Nero would die about a year after Paul in A.D. 68 of assisted suicide. Afraid to fall on his own sword, he asked a servant to do the deed. Nero had had been emperor since 54 A.D., and it had not been a smooth ride. The great fire occurred in AD 64, during which Nero was famously, if not erroneously, accused of fiddling. Uh, Fiddles didn't exist in the the 11th century, but uh, I digress. At least 70% of the city was consumed in the blaze, and the Christian community was an easy target to abuse and an easy target of abuse by mobs seeking to blame outsiders for foreign uh, or foreigners for catastrophe. Does that sound familiar? Church tradition says that the Apostle Peter was a victim of this outrage and was crucified head down. Later, Paul was beheaded, and within three or four years, the young church had lost its two foremost apostles including its most eloquent and learned voice, the Apostle Paul. However, the church was not without leaders. Although Peter and Paul were gone, a second generation of pastors were ready to carry the torch. One of these was Timothy, arguably Paul's favorite and most devoted disciple. It is Timothy whom Paul addresses his parting words to. Paul knew Timothy's mother and grandmother. He mentioned Timothy in the fundamentals of the faith. Timothy served with him in Ephesus for about three years and was no doubt with him on many of Paul's travels, including Troas, Philippi, and Corinth. He might have been introverted or uncomfortable with strangers. That happens. Because in 1 Corinthians 16.10, Paul suggests that when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord. Could speak to that. His health was frail, and he had lived in an age, he had, and he had lived in an age of pharmaceuticals. He may have popped a fistful of pills every day, but he did not. He is the patron saint of those with stomach disorders, an appellation based solely on the medical advice. Paul proffered in his first letter to Timothy, no longer drink only water, but take a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. In any case, Paul thought highly of his young protege, saying that I have no one like him and Timothy's worth, uh, Timothy's worth, you know, like how like a son and a father he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Now, when Paul writes his final letter, Timothy had been pastor at Ephesus for perhaps as long as four years. 
And like Paul, Timothy would do jail time. I, I want to see you know that our brother Timothy, Timothy has been set free because you see, like Paul, he too endured. Paul's last words to Timothy can be distilled, I believe, into four reminders. Recharge your batteries. Don't apologize. Hone your teaching skills. Protect what you have. First, Paul uses the word rekindle for recharge your batteries, which means to relight the fire, suggesting the flames may have died, the fire gone a little cold, or is in some way running low. We're in the third year of a pandemic, as it were. We understand how energy, passion, and enthusiasm can run low, right? We have all had the experience of passing through days, weeks, months of ennui and lassitude. The spirit is flagging. The fuel is low. We're going through the motions. Paul suggests that Timothy find some tinder and light a match. The fire can be restarted by remembering that it first burst into flames through the laying on of hands. In other words, the community of faith validated the gifts they saw in you, Timothy, and assured you in this rite of ordination that God was with you. If Timothy had a weakness, it might have been his insecurity or fear or timidity. Even if it's not the case, your pastor probably suffers from this much more than you realize. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, Paul writes. Paul had seen more danger in his lifetime than most of us will ever have to face. Timothy had been a part of some of these adventures. He has knowledge. Now Paul tells Timothy that living for Jesus requires courage, not cowardice. In today's words, Paul might have told Timothy to put on his big boy pants, lace up his boots, and saddle up. He might also ask Timothy if he had his keys. Keys to success, power, love, self-discipline. If you have these keys, there's no limit to the possibilities. Don't apologize. This advice comes to us from two unimpeachable sources, Uh, Jethro Gibbs and Captain Nathan Cutting Brittles, both fictional characters played by Mark Harmon and John Wayne, respectively. In the show NCIS, Gibbs' rule number six is never say you're sorry. It's a sign of weakness. The rule is a direct reference to John Wayne's catchphrase in She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, never apologize, mister, it's a sign of weakness. We don't need to apologize for our faith or about the, quote, testimony about our Lord, Paul says in verse 8. To keep this in perspective, note that millions of Americans believe lizard people secretly run the U.S. and that God has a vested interest in who wins the Super Bowl. And let me tell you, people believe a whole lot of other untrue, false crap other than that. We don't need to apologize for our faith. One study found that a third of respondents could name a right protected by the First Amendment and a similar amount couldn't name a single branch of government. So no need to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus was a witness more than 2,000 years ago to the love of God and his life and death and resurrection was presaged through the testimony of prophets like Moses and Elijah long before Christ was born. So there's no reason to cough, choke, or turn away or be embarrassed to identify yourself as a follower of Jesus. We might be ashamed, even mortified, of the behavior of some who call themselves Christians, but so was the Apostle Paul who despaired of those who loved the world more than they loved Jesus. Timothy must do his best to present himself as one approved by God to be a worker who has no need to be ashamed. We are not ashamed because we know the one in whom we have put our trust. And we know that he is able to protect us in uncertain times. 
there's not much one can be certain of anymore. And if you display that sort of certainty, I automatically have doubts about the correctness of your certainty. It's just impossible. But we know someone who is trustworthy and someone who will take care of our eternal investment. No need to apologize. And there's honing our skills. Hold to the standard of sound teaching, says Paul. The standard to which the apostle refers is, of course, his own, right? As you have heard from me, he says in verse 13, four keys in this advice hold standard sound teaching. Some time could be spent elaborating on this, but I'm not going to right now in great depth. But for example, sound teaching is so important that Paul suggests that it be firmly grasped. You might decide that uh, you can loosen your grips on other things, but hang on to sound teaching. And not just teaching, but the standard of sound teaching, following a core curriculum in a way that is understandable or, or makes sense, knowing people. Work on your, on your lesson plans. Show how your teaching is relevant to their lives. Make sure that the people understand learning goals. And our goals should be sound, that is cogent, rational, intellectually within reach of the average Joe. I've said it for years. If we don't get rid of our church vocabulary, people won't learn to speak it anymore. It's sort of like Greek and Latin. The ancient forms have gone out long ago. Yeah, there are bits and pieces that people still understand, but for the most part, it's relegated to the academics and the few people that don't mind spending their times in the dusty corner of university life libraries. Excuse me. We should be sound and understandable, accessible. And we shouldn't be seduced by theological fads also. Paul was very wary of that. He complained about itching ears and urged Timothy not to waste his time tilting at windmills, as it were, and preaching divisively about theological battles that are arcane and of interest only to those living in the ivory towers and molding books and dusty shelves. He mentioned sound teaching in his first letter and urged the inexperienced pastor have nothing to do with profane myths and old wives' tales or conspiracies we can read in there. Paul saw that a time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. Clearly, Paul had his reasons for urging Timothy to sharpen his teaching skills. If we don't handle that, church, it's a problem. And then there's protecting what we have. Paul says to guard the good treasure God has given you. What you have is a treasure regar uh, regarded as such. The faith you have is, has been given to you as a treasure Paul said something similar in his first letter where he said, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. What he has is his faith and his pastoral calling, and this is who he is, a person with faith and a calling. Don't lose it. It's who you are and defines you. Paul says, in effect, don't do anything that might compromise it or set you on a course that veers away from your current bearings. Be aware of your heading and flight plan. Follow your true north, which is Jesus Christ, your Lord. Even if it is 20 years on and you're just waking up to understandings about who you are, make sure you know who you are because it could cause you to make a massive change later on in your life that will be hard if rewarding. I'm sorry, a little bit of reality stuck in there. These are Paul's parting words to the young man who was a trainee, an intern, and then a co-worker 
with this apostle. His advice to Timothy was that he should not forget to recharge his batteries. He shouldn't apologize. He should hone his skills, protect what he has. His words are a challenge to Timothy to pick up the mantle, to be Elisha, to Paul's Elijah, to live a life of daring discipleship. And church tradition indicates that this is precisely what he did. He was the bishop of Ephesus for many years. In the year 97, at his advanced age, a formerly timid Timothy, often in poor health, tried to halt a pagan festival in honor of the Greek goddess Diana, which included a procession of idols, ceremonies, and songs. In response to his preaching of the gospel, the angry crowds beat him, dragged him through the streets, and stoned him to death. In his dying moments, perhaps, he recalled the words of his father in the faith, who wrote, Share in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Like his mentor before him, he too had fought the good fight, finished the course, and kept the faith. May there come more of his kind. Amen. Now let me invite you to stand as you are comfortable as we sing our communion hymn, number 393, Spirit of the Living God. We'll sing this through two times. about to partake of Holy Communion. Uh, As you have seen, our stewards have been hard at work, and you will see uh, elements have been laid out before you. After I take us through the communion liturgy and dismiss you, you will come forward as you feel comfortable and partake of the elements as you feel comfortable, and you may stay uh, knelt praying at the altar for as long as you uh, need. If you're joining us uh, virtually, uh, and this is your first time experiencing communion, or if this is your first time experiencing communion here, in the United Methodist Church, we practice an open communion table, meaning that we believe the grace of God is powerful and sufficient enough to be salvific in nature, to be the transforming force in your life, uh, that uh, that's what we, uh, we invite anyone to come, regardless of your prior affiliation to a church or faith, if you come with a heart desiring to find God, God will meet you here. And if you want to follow along, I do apologize, I forgot to have you follow along. On page 13, we will be following on the uh, communion uh, liturgy. It will start uh, just after the uh, the great thanksgiving, and uh, you'll just follow along uh, with me. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing 
always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread gave thanks to God, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so... In remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through Your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and Your Holy Church, all honor and glory is Yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may may I invite you to come forward and partake. with the ministry of First UMC of Hammond. Uh, please go to our website, hammondfumc.org. Uh, there, follow the donate button to the Tidely platform. Uh, now, may the ushers come forward as we give of ourselves and our gifts to God.
from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Accept, O Lord, these offerings your people make unto you, and grant that the work to which they are devoted may prosper under your guidance, all to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let me invite you to remain standing as, we, as you are comfortable as we sing our closing hymn, number 374, Standing on the Promises. All four verses. <laughs> place this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you all and give you peace. Amen.